afternoon, and welcome to the Concord Bookshop. Uh, according to the book, The Psychopath Test by John Rodson, approximately one out of a hundred people is a psychopath. Whether it runs in families and whether the occurrence is genetic or environmental is a matter of constant debate in the medical field. One thing we know for sure, though, the story of psychopaths, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, makes for a hell of a good read. And Dick's book is a hell of a good read. Follows the life of Whitey Bulger from his childhood in Southie and his first arrest at the age of 13 until he was apprehended in Santa Monica in 2011. Dick tells a fascinating tale of violence, murder, and narcissism. Dick Lair is a professor of journalism at BU and a formal, former prize-winning journalist at the Boston Globe. He's also the author of several books, including Black Mass, Whitey Bulger and the FBI and a Devil's Deal, and The Fence, a police cover-up along Boston's racial divide. Without further ado, Dick Lair. Well, thanks for that introdu uh, introduction, and uh, thanks for coming to the store today. Um, what I plan on doing, or what I hope to do, is I want to talk a little bit about the book, Whitey, the biography, um, and including in that is to share with you a brief excerpt from the book to uh, give you a taste, a flavor of the uh, narrative that uh, Gerard O'Neill, my co-author, and I have, um, have written in, in, in the biography. I want to start by um, uh, reminding or sharing with you, if, if, it's, if it's for the first time, but I, I probably around here it's not, reminding you of the significance of Whitey Bulger, the Bulger story. Um, it's He's been around a long time, and there's plenty of elements to his his, his standing now, I think, in, in, in the annals of, of, of history. I mean, I think history's going to show that he's one of the leading uh, crime figures in America in the 20th century. And the reason I say that is, is it's not about his body count. Uh, he's going to go on trial in June for racketeering, and in that racketeering charge, he's charged with 19 murders. There's more than that. It's not, the, it's not the body count which distinguishes him, I think. Uh, it's not his longevity. He's 83 years old now. He's been, a, been around a long time, been at the top of his game for a long time, and he was on the run for a long time, 16 years, until his apprehension in June of 2011. It's not the, math, the, the, the money and the fortune of underworld proceeds that he amassed all these years. But when it comes to Whitey Bulger, I think what singles him out is because when you say his name, in the same breath you have to say the FBI. And that's his, 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 his big marker in history, is that he accomplished, he did something no other crime boss in the history of, of America has managed to do. He harnessed the power of the FBI during those, what we now call, um, uh, the Black Mass years. Black Mass, our prior book, focused on the years Whitey was an FBI informant uh, from 75 into the early 90s, and it was um, the years in which the FBI protected him, uh, now allowing his rise to underworld power and then allowing his reign of terror all those years. Uh, that's the focus of Black Mass, and we've come to call those the Black Mass years. And that is the fact that he com co corrupted the Boston office of the FBI is the kind of thing that should, should, should worry us all, should give us chills, because we're not talking about a single investigation that went down the tubes. We're talking about a couple of generations, a generation or so, a couple of decades, a way of life in Boston that, um, that now stands out as the worst informing scandal in the history of the FBI. Uh, and then when you step back, as we do, have done in Whitey, to tell the life story, uh, to work on a full biography, because he has been around so long, you realize we come during our research that to study Whitey Bulger is to open doors into many other worlds uh, throughout the 20th century. It's it's the FBI, as I said already, uh, uh, being able to examine and go deep uh, into their so-called top echelon informant program, and how Whitey was in mid in, in, 19, in, in 1975 was brought into that. Uh, and to really examine the failure of that program. Uh, but more than that, uh, it takes us back into the 1930s uh, to when psychopath, psychopathy was first studied and when it was on the forefront of, 
of science and, and doctors trying to figure out what it, what it is and coming up with a diagnosis for it. You know, Whitey was emerging as a, as a young man and a psychopath during that time. Uh, at the same time as well, there was all this interesting um, sociological work underway trying to figure out juvenile delinquency. Again, at the same time, Whitey was earning his creds on the streets of South Boston as a juvenile delinquent getting arrested and, and whatnot. And uh, as part of the theme that I think fed his sense of entitlement later in life, for every trouble, every time he got arrested, he, he managed to find a way out without paying any real consequences. There's politics. Politics is a big subject that, that resonates throughout his lifetime, not only and not only because just because of his his family and his obviously his brother Bill Bulger, but when you study Whitey's life, you realize that people like Father Robert Drynan come in and out of his life during the 1950s and 60s when he's in federal prison. Uh, that's a big deal. And even bigger than that, Whitey had something going for him during his prison years for bank robbery that no other inmate had, and, and every other in inmate wished they had. Whitey Bulger had the, probably the second or third most powerful politician in America watching out for him, and that was House Speaker John McCormick. We uncovered in, in, in Whitey's prison file these letters, all this great stuff that you'll be able to read uh, in, in this book. Uh, between the McCormick and his office and the head of the prison system, uh, the head of the parole system, and with the Bulger family, all through the years in a way that um, improves and ac accelerates Whitey through the prison system. Um, another door that opens is the door into the rock, Alcatraz. We spend a fair amount of time in Alcatraz because so did Whitey. Um, and, 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 and there you meet a whole host of characters. Um, some of you may recognize his name. Does anyone recognize Frank Lee Morris as a name? The, uh, escape from Alcatraz. Escape yeah. from Alcatraz, exactly. He was one of the three men who escaped from Alcatraz and got into that raft that they made out of some rubber and stuff like that and stitched it together, and we've never heard from them again. It's, it's, a, it's become the stuff of legend and movies and whatnot. Well, why do you knew Frank Lee Morris? They met in Atlanta Penitentiary the, 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 the prison that they were at before transferred to Alcatraz. And it was in Alcatraz that Frank Lee Morris, he was the brainchild of this um, um, escape, and they did it by using spoons and little utensils to chip away uh, at the concrete and to dig a tunnel into the walls of Al inside the walls of Alcatraz and then you know, navigate their way down and uh, down the, the slope and, and into their raft. Well, you, you kind of take a chrono chronology and a timeline, and you put their effort, and you parallel that with Whitey's effort. Whitey was working on a way to go out the front door. Well, his friend Frank Lee Morris was chipping away with the concrete, with the help of people like House Speaker McCormick. Because in the end, Whitey um, uh, uh, got out of Alcatraz. He was in and out of Alcatraz uh, in about two years. And the reason why it was important for him to get out of Alcatraz as soon as he got in was because no inmate, I think maybe one time in the history of Alcatraz was an inmate directly released and paroled from prison. You had to get out of Alcatraz into a, a, a lesser secure facility in order to earn your way out into the street again. So the, you know, once he was sent to the Rock, the game plan was to get out as fast as he can. And he did. He got out in two years. The average day for, in the history of the Rock was eight years. He had a helping hand that no one else had. We document that for the first time. Um, the other thing um, that the other world we get into is, is, in, uh, is this whole LSD project that was going on in the 50s and the 60s. Uh, and that's the excerpt I want to read to you um, from uh, today. Does any, has anyone heard of this LSD project? Uh, something about it, the CIA role? Well, I, I want to uh, give you a little setup or a little context for it, because this was all new to me. I mean, I'd heard about, yeah, why he was in the LSD project. We mentioned that in Black Mass. Uh, at, you know, any of the other books that have come out have, have always referred to that. But for the first time, we were able to, for a variety of sources, to go deep on that. And I'd never realized that in the 50s, there was a very public face to the LSD project. Um, and by that, I mean publicity. It was open. It was public because the project was being done 
and it was be, there were uh, experiments being done in the, some of the federal prisons, like the Atlanta Penitentiary, where Whitey did it, but also at some of the universities. And the goal, the open goal that was written around, it written about in medical journals and in uh, the, the general press, was to try to find a cure for schizophrenia. That's what these doctors were up to with the LSD project. When they discovered, when LSD sort of came to America in, in, in the late 40s and whatnot, um, doctors realized this was a drug um, that could make people who took it uh, seem instantly insane. And they saw this uh, experimental value in it because schizophrenia, again, was one of the big medical challenges as, as of the time as it is today. Public health concern and all this uh, uh, medical effort was, was being brought to bear to try to come up with remedies for it. So these projects got underway where they would take volunteers or people and, and give LSD to patients. And once they're tripping or instantly insane, they would try different drugs that they hoped would help cure, help uh, improve or uh, uh, you know, be, uh, improve the symptoms of, of, of the insanity, so to speak. That's what was going on in the federal penitentiary. Um, Whitey, among, uh, uh, as well as other inmates, quote unquote, volunteered uh, for the project. Now the thing, the other piece of it that we hear so much, have heard so much about since is that unknown to any of the volunteers, whether you were an inmate in a prison or a college kid volunteering, was the secret role, the clandestine role of the CIA. They too had a huge interest in LSD as a possible um, you know, espionage drug, uh, maybe a truth serum. They didn't know. They just wanted to get in on, on these experiments. Um, uh, to, to see what the doctors were finding out in terms of the impact of LSD on patients. But also, and this is the, you know, the actually quite scary part, they started funneling drugs they wanted tested on, on the, the subject in addition to the LSD to see, you know, creating these cocktails to see what might happen and the impact and stuff. That's the part that did not come out, tumble out into the public eye until um, the 70s uh, and the 80s. Uh, and that's the part that I think most people have some grasp of. But it's, it's fascinating to go back and realize that um, you know, there was this piece of it that was very public and wide open and, and written a lot um, at the time. So I want to read um, uh, a passage um, from the book and um, uh, that uh, gets at you know, Whitey's role and Whitey's involvement in, in the project in Atlanta. Um, and it happened within a year of, he, went, he was sentenced to uh, prison in 1956 for bank robbery. Um, and um, he had a tough, uh, just a, a little bit more background, he had a, t t a really rough start. This is the first time he's doing hard time and, and paying any consequence for the, all the trouble he was making. Um, and within three months, uh, he was thrown into an eight-man cell which was not easy for a guy uh, then and now um, who is a control freak and likes to have real extreme control over his immediate environment and whatnot. To be put in an, as a 26-year-old um, bank robber in an, uh, a cell with seven other inmates who were from all over the country and didn't give two hoots about him, um, that was um, unsta unsettling for him because within three months, uh, he actually checked himself into the psych ward at the Atlanta Penitentiary, which was also kind of an astonishing fact to uncover uh, in the course of our research. Um, so that's, um, you know, by way of background. And then when he came out of that, uh, and he did get a, uh, his own cell after that, um, w within the course of the next year, he got a, um, you know, prison job in the hospital at the prison, which is where this excerpt begins. It was the new job that gave Whitey an up-close look at the LSD project. Now, nearly two years old, held on Tuesdays and Thursdays in the basement of the prison hospital. Word about the project had already spread publicly beyond the walls of the prison. The Atlanta Journal-Constitution had run a feature story about the experiment with the headline, Drug-Fed Prisoners Aid Study, along with a photograph showing one of the doctors interviewing an inmate volunteer. The article began, 16 prisoners at the Atlanta Penitentiary are helping medical researchers study mental diseases 
by voluntarily taking a potent drug that induces symptoms of schizophrenia. The newspaper interviewed the lead doctor, Carl C. Pfeiffer of Emory University, and quoted from a colorful account of one inmate's LSD trip. The newspaper did not identify the inmate, but Whitey and other prisoners easily could have recognized him as Winfield Burdett. The newspaper without credit had lifted the description of an LSD trip that Burdett had written for the Atlantean, the inmate publication, which is a great resource for us. We got all these inmates, they have a great inmate magazine. Then there was a national magazine called Man's Magazine, in an issue that included such articles as Ted Williams, Heel or Hero, and Virgins, Would You Marry One? ran a cover story titled, I Went Insane for Science. The author was a doctor writing anonymously about his experimental LSD trip, and the article included mention of Pfeiffer's work in the Atlanta prison. Whitey met with Pfeiffer and Pfeiffer's associates just a few weeks after he started working in the hospital in July. He underwent a screening process overseen by Lawrence L. Bryan, the prison psychologist who had admitted Whitey to the psych ward the previous October. Inmates called him the nut doctor. Dr. Bryan interviewed Whitey and administered psychometric tests, which included a Rorschach test designed to confirm a volunteer was normal. Doctors involved in the LSD project, when writing or talking about the inmates, meant normal in quotation marks, because none of them was that. The lead doctor was quoted saying inmate volunteers had all scored high in tests for psychopathic tendencies. They were not normal, he said. They were psychopaths. The point of the psychological screening, then, was to ensure the inmate was stable and could withstand the project's regimen of LSD and other drugs. Except for character disorders, no psychiatric abnormalities were present in these subjects, the doctor wrote in a journal article about the prison's LSD experiments. Finally, to make it all seem legal and ethical, Whitey sat down on August 6, 1957, with one of Dr. Pfeiffer's associates and signed on the dotted line. It was a document of disclosure explaining the benefits and risks that Dr. Pfeiffer had created specifically for the LSD project. And the one-page form bearing the signature of James J. Bulger carried a heading in capital letters contract between Department of Pharmacology, Emory University School of Medicine, and Human Volunteers at U.S. Penitentiary, Atlanta, Georgia. That's the kind of thing we uh, got a hold of in, in, in getting inside Whitey's prison file for the first time. 500 pages, we came across this contract that he had signed. Well then, one morning, two months later, after eating a light breakfast in the dining hall, Whitey was taken by a guard to the hospital, a building located on the west side of the prison compound behind the B cell house, where he'd been kept initially in the eight-man cell. With a prison population of more than 2,600, the size of many small towns across America, the hospital was fully operational. It had 75 beds and four full-time doctors, assisted by 11 medical technicians. Prisoners staffed other positions, from clerk to head operating nurse. And in any given year, 250 major and 750 minor surgical procedures were performed. Whitey walked through the main floor and down into the basement to Ward F, or the neuropsychiatric ward, where a large room, secured with a steel door and steel bars, was set aside for the LSD project. Whitey was a member of the Tuesday group of eight inmate volunteers checking in for a 24-hour stay. He walked into the plain, sterile room with its eight beds and joined the others. By now, Whitey knew the drill. He'd been part of the LSD project for more than a month. He sat on the bed. The doctors always encouraged subjects to remain in bed for the duration. By 8.30 a.m., or about two hours after breakfast, Whitey took the LSD dosage prepared for him, drinking it in a glass of quinine-flavored liquid. The drug was odorless and colorless. Then he waited. Would this be what the doctors called a quote-unquote trivial dose, meaning 25 micrograms, or something stronger? In his first month, he'd been given increasingly stronger doses of the psychedelic drug so that he could, as one doctor wrote, 
become fully familiar with the effects of the drug, both qualitatively and quantitatively. The first dosage was 25 micrograms, the second 50, then 75, and finally 100. Whitey would know in about an hour the strength of the dose after the systems began to manifest. When the LSD began working on his brain and causing havoc in the interaction between his nerve cells and the neurotransmitter serotonin. In the human body, it is the serotonin system that acts as a kind of control tower for behavior, perception, and moves. The first sign Whitey was on his way was the sensation that the lights were alternately dimming and brightening, as if someone were playing with the power supply. In fact, the lights were constant, but his pupils were dilated changing in diameter and affecting his light perception. To help him pin down the power of this trip, Dr. Pfeiffer and associate would soon come by to ask a series of 28 questions. Certain questions address symptoms evident in taking a low dose. Does the light bother you? Do you feel fatigued? Others addressed symptoms only seen only with higher dosages. Are things moving around you? Do you feel as if in a dream? Whitey would know the dose was on the stronger side if, when he closed his eyes, he saw an array of geometric patterns accompanied by a kaleidoscope of colors. Letting go could not have come easily. Whitey Bulger had always felt most secure when in control, but prison had changed all that. He'd lost nearly every measure of control, the eight-man cell being one ever-present reminder. Hallucinating on LSD meant losing even more. For someone who has a tremendous need for security through control, this could lead to a tremendous sense of anxiety, Dr. John Halpern, a psychiatrist at McLean Hospital in Massachusetts, commented later about the combustible mix of Whitey Bulger and LSD. It was October 8, 1957, when Whitey began this particular round of the drug. The date was exactly one week after America began sending B-52 bombers loaded with nuclear weapons, airborne around the clock in case of a Soviet attack. And it was only four days after the Soviet Union shocked America with its successful launch of the Sputnik satellite. The focus of the world was on the Cold War and Russia's ride into space, while Whitey was lying on a bed in Ward F, bracing himself for a different kind of trip, featuring tangerine trees and marmalade skies. <laughs> So, uh, hopefully that gives you a taste of, of what we've been able to do now because of all these new records uh, that have surfaced um, in the last few years and material that we were able to get a, 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 our hands on. I've mentioned already uh, Whitey's vast prison file. Uh, there's the CIA records that those of which have survived that document um, the, you know, the, um, the so-called LSD project. Um, we uncovered a, a court file, a court case down uh, in, in Georgia's uh, archives because a few years later some of Whitey's inmates, fellow inmates uh, in Atlanta um, uh, filed a federal civil rights lawsuit against the government. Uh, it, it didn't go anywhere, but in, this, in, this, in these old records was a wonderfully long and rich deposition of Dr. Carl Pfeiffer, um, the lead doctor on, on the project in Atlanta where we learned all kinds of new things about what went on in, in Atlanta. Um, there was a prison magazine I already mentioned, The Atlantean, which was just an enormously helpful resource, not only about the project, because there were these first-person accounts of, being, of, be, of belonging and participating in it, but also just wonderful articles describing the hospital, Ward F, uh, A Day in the Life, all, all kinds of inside, you know, uh, sort of contextual things about the Atlanta prison that we were able to, you know, you triangulate, you distill all these things, and then, and then you know, as an author, historian, you can, can write the narrative. Um, it's, it's amazing uh, in the end that, um, you know, this kind of project, uh, you know, got underway, uh, you know, looking back in time. But the incentive for the inmates, uh, the inmate incentive, I mean, they talked the talk of, you know, wanting to do good for mankind, the greater good. But it was something actually. There was something more selfish, selfish even if it was it seemed so minimal. E each each time you participated, you got three dollars a day in your in your commissary account and three days off in your in, in the calculation of, of your sentence. 
So it was three dollars a day and three days and three days off. That's that's what uh, an inmate volunteer person could gain uh, uh, from participating in the project. All right. So what I'd like to do now is uh, is open it up to to questions that you might have about you know the research for a book like this. Um, you know, you know, Whitey Bulger, his story, the FBI, whatever it might be. Yes, sir. Bulger, through his attorneys, says he was not a snitch. But the attorneys say that the FBI forwarded information regardless. What's the quid pro quo there? How is that going to hold up? Just, but the people under, refer, uh, understand what he's referring to in this question. It's, plain, it's, it, it's stuff that's coming off the news uh, of recent weeks. Um, the pre-trial um, news uh, uh, involving you know Whitey's case up in June. Yeah, there was a kind of a. I actually wrote an op-ed piece about this in the Globe uh, because it was sort of a shocking claim that Whitey has made in a letter to a friend, and now his his, his lawyer parroted it uh, after a court hearing a week or so ago, saying Whitey was never an FBI informant, uh, which is is shocking. But to me, after studying his life, to me it's not surprising at all. Um, despite the mountain of evidence otherwise, the reality that we know, Whitey has shown, and we documented in his story going back to you know, his 20s when he was first getting in trouble, um, this ability, and it's, it's part of being a psychopath, I think, of, of being able to do or say anything uh, in order to try to improve his lot. And in this instance, the whole informant thing is, is, is not so much legal, but you know, that's the worst, one of the worst things that could ever have come out about him was that he was an informant um, in terms of his, you know, reputation, his, you know, Irish gang kind of identity, the ultimate stand-up guy who, on the streets, you know, you know, go back to the 70s and 80s, who in an instant would kill him if someone suspected of being an informant. Ah, you know, that was the big shocker in the, in the 90s, early 90s. Uh, was that humble, this unfathomable concept that Whitey himself was an informant. So he's just kind of doing what he's always done. I'm not such a bad guy. I'm not an informant. I would never, you know, allow drugs in my South, in my South Boston neighborhood. All of those are lies. Um, so um, that's what I think is going on with him, you know, with this. It's, it's, it's a, um, and we, I, we actually use this to, to title a chapter. He, in one of the letters in the prison file, he wrote to Father Drynan, Robert Drynan. He had just become dean of, of the BC Law School. Um, in the letter, um, there's this line, he goes, Father, I am no angel, but, and the rest of it is, I don't belong here. I'm not as bad as they say I am. And, he, you know, that's what he's done all these years. I would never kill women like Deborah Hussey or Deborah Davis. Reality is otherwise. But that's that's the way he works. He can put on these masks, um, uh, you know, and that's I think that's um, for me. And you know, in the way that you know, taking black masks and going deeper and going into his life, you start to see these themes and, and where they begin and how they carry out. Different iterations, but so we're working on the same theme. Yes, sir. Could you expand on uh, Representative uh, McCormick's uh, shielding? I'm quite curious about that. Well, that's the kind of thing that, I mean, you'll find it braided in, in the book here. Um, uh, it's, it's in the letters, and, it, and we, the McCormick papers are at BU. We found some of the letters there. Um, and, you know, and, and I want to be fair in the sense that at the time, you know, Whitey was a 26-year-old uh, constituent, you know, who had been sent away for a 20-year sentence in armed robbery. His family had solicited, you know, they just, they, the luck of the draw that you happen to live in a neighborhood you know, whose congressman turned out to be House Speaker. Um, you could see it as constituent service. At that time, we had no idea, you know, what Whitey was going to become uh, once he came out of prison and, and you know, by this, in the 70s and 80s. Um, but the fact that remains that there are, you know, documented evidence, letters, in which, on a regular basis, McCormick is helping Whitey out in prison, whether it's restrictions regarding who gets to visit him, having those being eased, to even more important ones, which is like moving him through, getting him, once he, he, he screwed up in Atlanta and got sent to Alcatraz, because you know, he became a higher, he was, had so much trouble in, in Atlanta that that's why he got sent to the rock. But to get him out of there and keep him moving, and get him on a track where he could um, 
be parole. Um, and uh, so he had quite a bit of help on the outside. And, and I hope that answers your question, short of like you know, quoting and directly reading from the letters and the passages, which I'm not going to do. But that's, it's all in there. I mean, it's, it's fascinating. It's fascinating find. Yes, Steve. With your knowledge through two books and all your research, if you were cross-examining Whitey at trial, what are the questions you would ask him? In other words, what are you curious about that you don't already know in his motivation, in his mindset, in That's his great life? That's mm. a good question. It has to, no surprise coming from a terrific attorney that I'm familiar with. Um, well, there's two areas, but, but you've asked for just one. <laughs> the one. Um, I, I, well, I'm going to say both. The, the one area is the FBI as an institution. Um, I don't think, while well, we've learned so much, and we've learned that it wasn't just a couple of bad apples, a couple of rogue agents by the name of John Conley, who was his handler, and Conley supervisor John Morris, that it was a very corrupt, and it, the corruption predated them, and it spread throughout the Boston office, and it went up the ladder. So I don't think we've yet to have a full accounting of the FBI complicity and corruption uh, during, through its um, informant program, in which Whitey became, you know, the worst, the center of the worst scandal ever. Um, but we've, between, the, you know, the, the criminal cases. The families who have sought, whose, 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 whose family members were murdered on, by Whitey on FBI time, uh, those cases in federal court, there's been a handful of civil rights lawsuits. We've learned so much more, and we've learned names of other agents. Uh, they've never been prosecuted, we've been told, because of the statute of limitations. I, I'm not sure Whitey um, himself personally would be able to go up the ladder inside the FBI and give us a, a real look into that. Um, because he was, you know, on the street dealing mainly with uh, John Conley and John Morris and a, a couple other supervisors along the way. But one of the things I hope for from the trial is because he has a terrific defense attorney, Jay Carney. And I hope Jay Carney, as part of what's required of him, which is to give his client as, as, as vigorous a defense as he can, I hope he rattles the government some more and shakes loose some more of this institutional corruption that uh, caused so much damage mm -hmm. for so long. So that's one piece. But for Whitey, what I would like to ask him about is Brother Bill. Mm -hmm. His brother Bill. Mm -hmm. Because only Whitey knows. Okay? Um, again, one of the surprises of, of working on this book and writing this book is, is seeing evidence. I mean, we all knew they're supremely loyal. I mean, Whitey never turned him in. And, I mean, Bill never turned him in and stuff. He testified at Congress. We, we knew the, of the loyalty and the bond, but to get down into it and find specific events and details and documentation of that loyalty going back, back, and back, and seeing it um, stay strong and solid through the years, that was really neat. That was really cool. Um, but you're not going to get any of that out of Whitey directly, are you? But that, you're, you're asking me what my wish was, I guess. I mean, yeah, yeah, no. I mean, if if if, if we could make if you him ask talk. him about Billy, he'll just say he had no involvement. Yeah, no, that's the reality. But that, and I'm saying, what I would like to know more about from him, if he would answer the question, would be what, if anything, does Bill know, and how, if you know, in, you know, how, to any degree, was he involved? Um, because one of the things, and there's a, it, it's a chapter later in the book after Whitey uh, is tipped off in 95 and takes off and uh, becomes a fugitive. We call this chapter The Band of Brothers. And it's a chapter in which we really lay out the loyalty. And, the, and in those first couple of years, it was especially Jackie brother, Vulture, the, uh, the third brother, and how they stayed in touch. Uh, and Kevin Weeks was the conduit. He was the sort of center of the wheel. Whitey would reach out to Kevin Weeks, and Kevin Weeks would huddle with Bill Bulger, and Kevin Weeks would huddle with Jackie Bulger. And that went on for a couple of years until Whitey did what you're supposed to do if you want to stay on the run and, and stay free and not apprehended. You have to cut ties. Um, so um, by the end of 1996, or nearly two years after he had begun his fugitive life, he cut ties with Kevin Weeks. Um, and. Uh, 
and Kevin Weeks never had any contact with him after that. And, and we obviously know it was 2011 before when he was captured. And one of the big questions, uh, again, remains, having lost Kevin Weeks as the contact, um, did the Bulger family find some new way at times over the years to get word to, to Whitey or for Whitey to get word to them? That's something we, again, only they know. Um, there's no evidence that has surfaced to, to suggest that they have. Um, but you have to wonder, given, again, their closeness, the bond, the loyalty, the protection they've offered each other for so many years. That's an area I'd like to, it's unfinished business, and I'm not sure we'll ever know. Yes, ma'am. Um, you've talked a lot about it, and it sounds absolutely fascinating, all the written sources that you've been able to find. Were there also a lot of interviews you were able to do for the book, or is there nobody who talks? Oh, yeah, we had, you know, we've done lots of interviews over the years, uh, going back to our right. years at, at the Globe, some of which we were able to, um, you know, they didn't have a bearing so much in, in Black Mass, but now when you're doing a biography, it had a bearing. Like, um, Will McDonough becomes a figure in our book here in a way that, uh, even though we had interviewed him, uh, obviously, well before he died, um, and uh, that that was all fascinating material that we, you know, we were able to go back and, and repurpose or, re, you know, or use. Uh, but we had, yeah, we had a, a, a lot of terrific new interviews, a lot of great interviews regarding, you know, one of the, after his capture, what was the big question? is like, whoa, what was his life like out there, you know, in Santa Monica? Um, and how did he get caught? You know, and so we had a lot of new interviews in connection with, with his life there, a lot of new material to work with on that. And also, I think, tell the story of the day he was captured in a, in a way that hasn't been... Uh, doesn't have, you know, hasn't been told with the kind of detail and drama um, that we were able to get uh, from these new interviews. Um, and, and, you know, what was kind of uh, interesting, and the, and the questions that everyone did know answers to, you know, going back to when he was captured in the, in the months following was, you know, what kind of life did he lead? Was he still a gangster? And all that kind of stuff. Well, the bottom line is, and that's why it's like a chapter as opposed to, because there was talk about being, you know, possibly books written about his, his life as Charlie Gasco. Well, he ended up living a, you know, a really ordinary life uh, as Charlie Gasco with Catherine as, as Carol. Um, yeah, he stockpiled money and he bought some more guns and stockpiled his, his weaponry. Um, and yeah, he exploited uh, a handful of homeless people to s steal their identity so that he could move about and get you know, m you know, his prescription medication when he needed to and go to the doctors or, or stuff like that. Uh, but he, it, you know, it, it, compared to what he had been in Boston, he was truly a, a different person, a different life, and retired from. He was retired from being white. That's <laughs> <laughs> Charlie Gasco. Didn't believe it. Yes, sir. Hi, um, I've been reading some of the uh, articles of the Globe recently, where uh, the white is in jail and he's writing to a, a friend of his. Yeah, uh, Richard Bamone. Sunday. Yeah, yeah, um, and he's talking about uh, um, uh, Kathy Gray. Yep. Uh, and it seems to inferring he'd do anything if they'd just leave her alone. Right. Would he? I don't. Now that he has the chance? I don't buy all that stuff. And this gentleman's referring to um, one of Whitey's friends in first in Atlanta. He was his lifting mate. Uh, and then in Alcatraz was uh, a guy by the name of Richard Sunday, also a weightlifter, really tough guy. Nice man. I interviewed him too. He's in, in our book. Um, Whitey and he have resumed their friendship since Whitey's been held in Plymouth. Uh, and they've been writing letters. Um, and Sunday has shared a lot of those letters with, with the Globe, and so they've been quoting extensively from them. Um, and, and in which Whitey comes off, you know, professing his love for Catherine Gregg, his devotion, and that's what you're alluding to, and stuff like that. Um, there's no question, I mean, you know, they were a couple out there. Uh, she took care of them. They're, you know, uh, there is, a, again, a connection and a bond there. But when I read, you know, I look at those letters as, as, as the equivalent of like an open mic for Whitey Bulger. To start talking this kind of, why do you talk with him? To saying things that, um, like, uh, it sounds so much like, you know, when he was in Atlanta, and uh, some of the, uh, he started complaining, to, you know, at least he complained to the guards, because he was trying, to, he put on a new mask. He was trying to emerge as the model inmate so that he could get out of the, uh, Alcatraz. And in his records, he's talking about how he wants to get a new cell because the inmates next door to him are too vulgar. 
They take God's name in vain and they speak ill of women and things like that. This is Whitey Balter. <laughs> and it, it's in the paper. You know, I mean, it's in the, in the prison records. It is such a joke. Um, so I find these, you know, this, this stuff he's t saying to Richard Sunday, a, a little, you know, it, it's all, it's Whitey being Whitey. And, and I think instead, um, and, you know, we have some of that in the book and stuff, and I think what your job is as, as uh, a, a journalist and someone who's studied it and trying to, or a historian or a biographer, put it in perspective, is to put it in perspective. And to see, and connect, say, this is, this is a new, new version of the old tune. Um, and uh, because, you know, uh, to try to cast what they had in Santa Monica and what they shared now as some kind of sweet romance, love story, it's a, it's a, little, a little tough to hear, a little tough to take, and yet that's one of the vibes out there about that, and that's his vibe. Um, if he wants to, you know, make those kinds of assertions and stuff like that, why doesn't he sit down and do an interview with 60 Minutes or, you know, <laughs> or the folks from the Globe or for, with us? I, I, I wrote him five times saying how much, you know, me and Jerry O'Neill, my co-author, wanted to come down and talk to him for our biography. Um, but then, he, I mean... He, he can control what he says to Richard Sunday and what then gets out because he can. He, those are his words. But. So anyway, so, somehow, Paul. Um, isn't a whole takeaway from from this thing? And it goes back to Black Mass. Is that you know after 9/11 you had all these um, pundits on TV saying you have all these intel agencies. You have the FBI. You have military intelligence. You have. Uh, NSA and all these agencies with all these little pieces of information and if they could share all those you know pieces and and weave them together suddenly we could have prevented 9-11 but it's and, and then it sounds like a no-brainer but of course the flip side of this is why it's like all it takes is one person who weaves their way into um, one of these agencies whether he's uh, you know South Boston crime boss or he's a jihadist, and then suddenly he can compromise, you know, if all these agencies are sharing, he can compromise that information. Yeah, and getting at the core, I mean, once he had the FBI, I mean, that's, it became, yeah. law enforcement was so divided, yeah. and hostile to each other, because the FBI had so much at stake with Whitey Bulger starting in the, you know, late 70s and all through the 80s, that, uh, I mean, it's a mistrust that that's still hasn't gone away, even yeah. though Whitey's been captured. And that's disabling, uh, in a big way, uh, you know, the effectiveness of, of law enforcement. Because you had all these, you had Boston Police, State Police, DEA, the Federal Drug Agency. No one, you know, trusted each other. Uh, and, the, and the FBI was, you know, again, the elite federal agency, you know, was telling anyone to back off and leave us alone and, and you know, and, and deeply compromised and corrupted uh, by this guy. Why? A couple more questions. Comments. Yes. The, the, yeah. One working on my. Okay. As you're getting close to the bad guys, getting close to the bad good guys, they're aware of it. I'm sure. You ever feel for your personal safety? Um, Anybody not, ever approach you? No, I think we're, history. I mean, we've moved too many years past those days. How many times? <laughs> <laughs> but back in the late '80s, when I was at the Globe and with a team of reporters uh, working, the editor was Jerry O'Neill on the Spotlight team, uh, and we documented this in a chapter in Black Mass. When the Globe, when we wrote for the first time in 1988, that we called it a special relationship, and we review it again in here. It's called 32 Words. We wrote a story about the Bulgers, and in that story, we wrote about Whitey and John Conley and the FBI that um, that they're you know basically called him you know, out of, that, that he was an informant. Um, around that story, uh, because if you can remember back in the late '80s, you know Whitey, Whitey was the good bad guy, the Robin Hood of the underworld, uh, the ultimate stand-up guy. The idea that he'd have something going on with the FBI informing. I mean, it's just it, it, you know you're on LSD, you know, if you think of that. Um, uh, and then the FBI is so powerful, and r right up to publication, they were always lying to us and then to the public, because after the story, they denied, they said the Globe, it's, it's a lie, it's false. And they helped spin this thing that it was just about the liberal Globe, trying to, you know, bash the Bulger family, and that's been a refrain all these years. But prior to that publication, it was really kind of an anxious time. Um, uh, one, of, one of the FBI agents, uh, and, and what's, what's freaky, because the FBI was the messenger for Whitey. Uh, 
uh, talking to one of my colleagues on this team, talking first to Jerry O'Neill, saying I want to talk to a colleague, and saying you guys don't know what you're up against. Um, and then saying something like, you know, if Whitey doesn't like what he reads in the paper, he wouldn't think twice about coming into your living room and blowing your brains out. Oh, thanks for the tip. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the, they were the messenger. So it's freakier. I mean, the whole FBI thing was to me, bad guys are bad. The FBI is supposed to be good. Mm -hmm. So when they go so horrible, it turns out to be so horribly bad, because we had no idea then. That was talking about a proverbial tip of the iceberg. Uh, we didn't you know what came gushing out during the Wolf hearings in the 90s and how you know, the scope and the depth of the corruption, whoa, and the murders. I mean, the FBI has tons of blood on its hands because of this. So, but we didn't know it. We were just at the front end. But that's so much has happened since, and so you know, no, I don't feel it. I don't think there's any problem anymore. So, last question. Then we're gonna stop. Thank you. Um, just to go back to the family relationship. Yep. Wasn't that the reason that then Governor Mitt Romney gave for removing? William Bulger from the presidency of UMass, of the yeah. He had to go. And Tom so Riley, I think, was calling for it, too. It had, yeah, because um, in the search for Whitey and, and all that, mm -hmm. uh, Bill Bulger had been called before a grand jury and then mm -hmm. was required to testify uh, before a congressional hearing. And he was evasive uh, and, mm -hmm. and, and whatnot. And, and Mitt Romney came out saying, this is not the way we want a UMass president to be behaving. Kind of thing. I mean, that's it in a nutshell. But yeah, no, both Romney and and Tom Riley at the time both called call for him to resign. Uh, Even and instinctively, he, he first said no way, but within a month. He did. Because he was supposedly raising money uh, well, for he was the university very good at and the connection with the legislature. Yeah. Oh yeah, no, he's kind money. of a, a great choice for a, a state money. university uh, on those for those two reasons. <laughs> Well, thanks again for coming. I appreciate you. uh, your questions uh, and, uh, and your time. Thank you. Thank you for coming today. We have copies of Whitey and we also have copies of Black Mask. Kindly stick around and sign them for you.